This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you've been able to hear the previous hour uh, when Jennifer Whiteman provided an introduction to the topic of greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. Both of these presentations will be recorded and available uh, online. I'm going to talk about some specific uh, soil health practices and uh, using an example of the fast greenhouse gas tool and a few key research results to talk about how we can think about soil health practices and their effects on net greenhouse gas emissions. There are lots of options for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. And I hope you uh, were able to hear Jennifer's previous talk where she went through quite a number of these. I'm gonna focus on the bottom four here that are highlighted in, in red font. I'm gonna be focusing on uh, commodity crop production in New York state. But a lot of these results are relevant for some other cropping systems and certainly for other states as well. So the fast greenhouse gas tool is something we developed to estimate greenhouse gas emissions from some of the most important commodity crops uh, in the US. Sorry, I... <clears throat> Uh, and some of the most important soil health practices. This is available as an open source online calculator at the website listed here. And I also put that in the chat box as well. It includes cover crops, tillage and nitrogen fertilizer management for corn, soybean and wheat in the USA. So it is important to recognize this as a national tool. Well, some of the most important aspects of this tool, uh, our goal is to account for the impact of management practices. So we're really interested in what is the change in greenhouse gases uh, going from kind of a conventional practice to an improved soil health practice. We also wanted to make a tool that's, that will work with little or no farm specific data. I apologize for the slides advancing. I seem to have them automatically set. Uh, so I'll be bouncing back and forth a little bit. We wanted to be able to make estimates with little or no farm specific data. So we used uh, soils data for every county in the country and, and yield data as well. We wanted this tool to be grounded in a mechanistic understanding of, of how carbon and nitrogen actually function in soils. At the same time, we want it to be grounded in the results of long-term field experiments. So trying to make it as realistic as possible for production agriculture. And lastly, it's publicly available and it's thoroughly documented. So you can look under the hood and see what's happening. This is what the initial screen of the tool looks like. <clears throat> So on the left, there's a limited number of choices that you can make uh, to use the tool for different crops and practices. And on the right, we have to start with the results tab where the results will be shown once you choose your crop and practice. <clears throat> so the first step in using the tool is to select the state and the county that you're interested in and also the crop. The next step is to choose the practices that you'll implement. So you can implement one or more practices. And within each of these practices, there are a few different choices. For example, for cover crops, you can choose a legume, a non-legume, or a, mixed, uh, a mixture of legume and non-legume. I'm gonna go through four examples for corn. A cover crop, a legume cover crop, a non-legume cover crop, precision nitrogen fertilizer management, and reduced tillage. All of these examples, I will 
will be for Tompkins County, where the live uh, portion of this meeting is taking place today. And this is all corn for grain. <laughs> okay, so here are the results. And I'm gonna walk, walk through this in some detail here because the layout of these results will be the same for each of these examples. In summary, at the, at the bottom of the, the chart is the total in green. So this total is showing that a legume cover crop, the tool is estimating that on average across many farms and many years, a legume cover crop will decrease net greenhouse gas emissions. So the positive values here indicate a decrease because the tool again is focused on what is the greenhouse gas benefit of using this practice. So the total bar, as I just mentioned, is below in green, and that's showing the megagrams or metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions per hectare per year. So you can see right away that the tool is using uh, scientific units, not English units. The rest of the bars above the green bar show the different categories of greenhouse gas emission that are being estimated. So the top one is nitrous oxide emissions. So a legume cover crop will decrease nitrous oxide emissions. The next one down is nitrogen fertilizer production. And again, this practice is reducing emissions from the fertilizer production. So this is indicating the nitrogen fertilizer, inorganic nitrogen fertilizer has a lot of greenhouse gas emissions due to the production. It requires a lot of energy and there are also nitrous oxide emissions with the production. So if we can reduce fertilizer use, we reduce the emissions of nitrous oxide in the field, but we also reduce the upstream emissions of nitrous oxide. The next topic is leakage and that's zero. And I'll talk about that later with another example where it's not zero. The inputs we see here is actually a negative value. The bar is going to the left and that indicates there's actually an increase in greenhouse gas emissions with inputs. And the reason for this is there are some emissions associated with producing cover crop seed and, and everything else that's required to successfully grow the cover crop. There, the next topic is inputs from tillage. This is zero because in this example, we made no change in tillage. The next one category is fuel for the cover crops. So planting the cover crops does require additional tractor passes and there are emissions associated with that. Now, if you heard Jennifer Whiteman's previous talk, we have to be careful with greenhouse gas accounting. At the state and national level, fuel emissions from tractors are counted in the, in the energy sector and not in the agriculture sector. That's an accounting convention that's designed to make sure that nothing gets double counted and nothing gets missed. However, if we are interested in the impact of a soil health practice on total greenhouse gas emissions, it's important to include that energy, uh, the, the, the emissions from the tractor passes, as well as including these upstream emissions from fertilizer manufacture, which also would typically in an inventory not be counted in the agriculture sector. The last component of the total, so the bottom gray bar here is soil organic carbon. So we see this is a benefit here for this practice. So when we use a legume cover crop, we're increasing soil organic carbon. <clears throat> but this, the important thing here is we're not focusing on any one of these 
factors, not just nitrous oxide, not just soil carbon change, but instead we're adding them all together to see the net uh, benefit. The next example is a non-legume cover crop. And here we see a red bar for the total at the bottom. And there's actually an increase in greenhouse gas emissions when we use a non-legume cover crop. Again, this is a prediction the model's making an average across many farms and many fields. Now, why is this happening? So here, again, we look above at the gray bars to see where did the total come from? And we see that most of these categories actually cause an increase in emissions. The only category that shows uh, a benefit is the soil carbon sequestration. So we're getting a benefit of soil carbon sequestration, but we're getting an increase in nitrous oxide emissions. Now this is not, may not be intuitive. Why is this happening? The reason this is happening is based on farmers' practices and many extension recommendations, we think it's likely that there'll be actually additional nitrogen fertilizer used when a non-legume cover crop is used to make sure there's adequate nitrogen available for the main crop. So there's an increase in fertilizer use, which increases nitrous oxide emissions here and also increases, there's some emission from the production of the fertilizer. And again, as for the legume cover crop, there are some emissions associated with inputs for the cover crop and fuel for the cover crop. Again, we look at all these different components together and there's actually an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. However, this is relatively small. It's less than a 10th of a ton of carbon dioxide equivalents per hectare per year. And there are many, we can imagine many variations on how the practice is implemented and the cropping system that would affect these results. <clears throat> the third example is precision nitrogen management. So here we're talking about using uh, sophisticated tools to really dial back and make sure we're applying just the amount of fertilizer that's needed at the right time uh, when the crop can use it. So here it's all good. The total at the bottom shows a benefit, a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. And the decrease is due to a decrease in the direct nitrous oxide emissions. And that's because we're using less fertilizer. So we're getting a better efficiency. More of the nitrogen that's applied is being taken up by the crop there's less that's available to be lost as nitrous oxide or leached as, as nitrate or lost in any other way. And again, we're getting a benefit where we're using less fertilizer. So we're reducing emissions associated with the production of that fertilizer as well. <clears throat> the last corn example here is no-till. And as shown in the total uh, green bar at the bottom, Again, there's a net benefit here of this practice of about a, a tenth of a, a metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. And most of this impact is actually from what? Is it from soil carbon sequestration? Well, there is a benefit of soil carbon sequestration here, but there's a much larger benefit from reducing the tractor passes. And this gets into the issue of permanence. Uh, so we, we include in this tool a discount uh, because soil carbon sequestration may not be permanent. In other words, if we do no-till for 10 years, but then we go back to a, a full tillage for several years after that, we've lost, we can lose all of the carbon that's been sequestered in the soil. So that the tool discounts this uh, by a factor of, of a half. So if we kept up this practice for a hundred years, the soil carbon benefit would be greater. 
The last example I'll give using the fast greenhouse gas tool is, is wheat. And again, this is also in Tompkins County uh, and some information about the crop yield and nitrogen rate are, are shown here. For all of these examples have been on a silt loam soil. So for the wheat no-till example, we get an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> so that's shown at the red bar for the total at the bottom. Well, how did this happen? If we look above at the gray bars, they're all over the place. There are, there are four of them which provide a benefit. So we're getting a reduction in nitrous oxide emissions, a reduction in fertilizer production, uh, a reduction in fuel use and a, a benefit of increased soil carbon, but we're getting this big leakage term. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, this leakage is happening because uh, long-term field experiments in the US have shown that often no-till can cause a, a small decrease in yield for wheat of about 4%. So when we have a decrease in yield, it's not causing any greenhouse gas emission directly in this field. However, at the global scale, if we reduce production of wheat in the US, it's very likely to increase somewhere else in the world. And there can be large emissions of greenhouse gases associated with an increase in production wherever it occurs. Think about in some cases, forests are cut down and burned to create new cropland. And there are a lot of emissions associated with that, even though that only happens on a small uh, fraction of global cropland. <clears throat> so leakage is a, it, it, so what leakage means is that a change in, in our location that we're interested in, in a specific field, or a specific state or country causes a shift in greenhouse gas emissions to another location. And, and it's important to account for that kind of a problem. Although it's challenging to do so, it's important not to leave this out of the equation. As we can see here, it's actually the largest impact of anything here. And it's causing the total to be uh, a small increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, clearly, farmers are not interested in a yield decrease. And if we could eliminate the yield decrease in this example, we would switch the sign of the, the total, right? It would become positive. There'd be a, a net greenhouse gas benefit if we didn't have a yield decrease. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about uh, some other aspects uh, of the tool that you might like to explore. So there's some optional advanced inputs that are very important. Uh, right at the bottom here, it says show advanced inputs. And if you click on that button, you get a few options. A really important one is crop yield. So this is a way you can put field specific or farm specific information as an input to the tool. And we expect that if you're using farm specific information, you should get a better, uh, a result that's more relevant for your farm or field. This is especially important because as I mentioned, this is a national tool. And so the, the national values for nitro inorganic nitrogen fertilizer use are, are used in this tool that are published by the Economic Research Service. But those don't account for the fact that there's a lot of manure used in New York State. So we recommend in New York State always using the advanced input option and putting in, uh, putting in an appropriate nitrogen fertilizer rate. <clears throat> the last option here under advanced inputs is your estimate of this discount factor for whether, whether cover cropping will be continued indefinitely or whether there's some chance that it might be discontinued. So this is over a hundred years. 
Now this seems kind of crazy, right? A farmer or, or any of us cannot predict what someone will be doing a hundred years from now. But this points out the challenge here uh, of practices that are not permanent when we're trying to address the issue of climate change, which is important on scales of decades to centuries to thousands of years. So if we don't have permanence for at least a hundred years, then we're getting less of a benefit in mitigating climate change. As I mentioned previously, we set this at 50%, that there's a 50% that once you start cover cropping, you'll keep, that'll continue to occur on that field for a hundred years. But you can change that value here. If you could somehow guarantee it would be a hundred percent, you can input that value. There's also other information available from the tool. So if you hover your arrow when you're using the tool over something like tillage practice, you get a pop-up window that defines the three practices that you can choose from. There's also other information available from some different tabs uh, above the graph here. So here we've so far just looked at the results tab, which shows the graph of results. It's empty here because no practices have been selected. But there are other tabs here. For example, the calculations tab that allows you to uh, see a lot of information about what's going on in, in creating these estimates from the tool. So if you click on that tab, it shows you your user inputs. So you can confirm, yes, that's what I intended to, to put in there. Below that, it also shows what's called derived parameters. So given the inputs that you provided and a lot of information that's stored in the tool about soil, crop yields, uh, and fertilizer rates, uh, and many other things, this shows you many of the values that are calculated in the model. So you can see if you think they're appropriate for your situation. And then below those parameters, it shows the results of calculations. So if you wanted the exact values for the breakdown of your results, you can get them here. And you can also, in, in this, uh, for example, you could see that 4% yield decrease from the wheat uh, example. That would show up in, in this internal, uh, this tab. There's also thorough documentation available from the website. So you can download this PDF file and read about the equations, the assumptions, and the data that are used in the model. Now, this tool, like any similar tool has limitations. Uh, as I mentioned, the default fertilizer rate for New York should not be used for most purposes. Instead, you should use the advanced inputs option and define the nitrogen rate. And you should also define the yield if you have that information. <clears throat> like other tools, it can't include all the variation among farms and practices. There are a limited number of crops and a limited number of, of practices that are included. And those are included because they're important crops, important practices, and there are enough data about them to make uh, robust predictions. So how should this tool be used? Uh, so what are some of the uses of it and limitations of the results of the tool? So this, yes, this tool can be used to help identify benefits and challenges with greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. And yes, it can be used to compare results from long-term experiments to look for differences. Uh, so maybe you have a good estimate for one portion of, like, maybe you have good data on soil carbon sequestration. Uh, maybe from some long-term experiments, maybe from some farm-specific data. But you need an estimate for some of the other components of the net greenhouse gas emission. So you can use those, uh, you could combine those together. 
you might also have results from along in, in terms of research and, uh, and making improvements in the future, ex experimental results might differ from this. And that should cause you to think about, is there an issue with the experiment or is there an issue with the model? So uh, limitations of the tool, it cannot be used to make a specific quanti quantitative prediction of benefit for a specific farm. The intent is to make a prediction of the average across many farms and many years. And it can't be used as a verification of, of a mitigation from an activity. So we do not recommend that this or similar tools be used uh, to, as a verification, for example, in a carbon market situation. <laughs> so that concludes the, the portion of, of my talk using the fast greenhouse gas tool uh, as a way to talk about net greenhouse gas emissions and as a way for us to think about some of the different sources of those emissions and how they add up. Next, I'm gonna talk a little more about uh, some of these management practices and show a little bit of data from a long-term field experiment. So reducing excess nitrogen inputs is a large part of greenhouse gas benefits. So I'm gonna spend a little time on this topic. Uh, one point I wanna make is reducing nitrous oxide emissions is permanent. So if we reduce fertilizer use for a crop without reducing yield, that's a permanent reduction in the nitrous oxide emission, uh, both in the field and, and from the factory. So it's not reversible uh, in the way that storing carbon in soil is, can be reversed with a change in practice. If you stop if you apply excess nitrogen again, you will have a emission associated with that, that excess in that year, but it won't change the result of what you did the previous year. And then of course, we need to keep in mind that we're not managing soils and crops primarily for greenhouse gas reduction. So uh, there are many reasons to add organic matter to soil, as many of you very well know. Um, there are many reasons that that's really critically important, uh, depending on your farm situation. So we want some of these uh, benefits from organic matter addition. Uh, in this talk, we're just focusing on the greenhouse gas aspect of that. So this graph shows for different crops, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, estimated for, for New York State. And this was done for a bioenergy analysis. So the only one I wanna focus on is just the maize or corn, the tallest bar here. And this is showing uh, the total emissions is, is in categories here. So the largest total emission is the light pink, and that's the direct nitrous oxide emissions from the field. There's also a darker, uh, a dark red color, which is indirect emissions of nitrous oxide. So this is nitrogen that actually leaves the field in some other form, uh, chemical form. Uh, such as nitrate or ammonia volatilization. And it's, but there are nitrous oxide emissions associated with that nitrogen somewhere after it leaves the farm field. It's small. There's also uh, a dark pink uh, portion of the bar, which is the production of synthetic nitrogen. So as I've mentioned several times, there are substantial emissions associated with nitrogen fertilizer production. Then there are emissions associated with lime, uh, production of the lime, equipment, and fuel. This particular analysis does not include any change in soil carbon. So this is not looking at a change in practice 
It's just an average emission from New York corn production, corn grain production. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as you see in this quote, nitrous oxide emissions are, are increasing. Uh, and in fact, they've exceeded some of the previous emission scenarios. So this is really an urgent issue at the global scale. So in agriculture, we can make a contribution to this. So the basic issue is that only about half of the nitrogen fertilizer we apply often goes into the crop and the rest is gonna go somewhere else. A small amount of it can be emitted as nitrous oxide, but it's so potent that it's an important greenhouse gas. It can also be leached as nitrate and, and it can pollute uh, groundwater or surface waters. It can be emitted as ammonia and, and create air pollution issues. So improving nitrogen management can improve profitability, first of all, if we can reduce fertilizer use, use it more efficiently uh, and maintain crop yield. And we can get benefits for water quality, air quality, and soil health. So how can we achieve these kinds of emissions? So I showed one example of uh, precision nitrogen management previously, and how can we actually accomplish that? Well, many of you are familiar with the four R's of fertilizer management, the right source, rate, time, and place. So that gives us the goal, but we need tools to help us achieve that goal. Uh, and one such tool is ADAPT-N. I'm not gonna describe it uh, in any specifics, uh, but it's been developed here in New York State. And it allows you to use a web-based platform to put in information from your field and use recent weather data to get a specific uh, side dress nitrogen recommendation for corn. And these kinds of tools can help achieve these four R's of maintaining or increasing crop yield and reducing nitrogen losses, including nitrous oxide emission. In many cases, this can improve profitability because we're improving nitrogen use efficiency. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about a field experiment uh, with manure and cover crops. I'm not gonna talk about compost and biochar, uh, but I just wanna mention those are other ways that organic matter uh, can be added to soil. Those of you who are in the live uh, room today will get the benefit of presentations this afternoon and tomorrow on this topic. So what happens to nitrous oxide emissions when you add a lot of carbon and nitrogen to crop cropping system as manure or as a legume cover crop? I'm gonna talk about one recent publication from Pennsylvania uh, looking at uh, orga an organic uh, long-term experiment. So again, this is a, a well-drained silt loam soil uh, and the crop rotation, there were multiple crop rotations in this experiment, including corn, both for grain and silage, soybean and spelt, a uh, winter grain. The treatments, included different types of tillage, different cover crops, and different manure management. And the authors stated that these variations were typical of regional organic agriculture. So this is a complicated graph showing uh, the, some key results. So I'll talk you through this graph. Uh, on the vertical axis is nitrous oxide emission. Uh, so the higher up we go from blue to red is showing higher nitrous oxide emissions. And at the highest amount, uh, if we translate the units from what's shown here, which is uh, emissions per day, at an annual scale, the highest amount here caused an emission of five tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year as nitrous oxide. 
If you remember from our examples of, from the fast GHG tool of improving management, we were getting a fraction of a ton uh, benefit. So, so at the highest amounts here, these are very high amounts of nitrous oxide emission. On the right bottom axis is manure residue. So this is the dry tons of manure that were added. And if you follow the curve uh, on the rightmost part of this the colored graph, you can see that as you increase manure from zero to two, almost up to four, there's very little increase in nitrous oxide emission. But once you get to four and above, you get a rapid increase in nitrous oxide emission, which then levels off. Similarly, on the left-hand bottom axis is the legume residue. So again, this is the amount of legume biomass that's being added. And the scale is different. So when you go from adding a little bit of residue, one ton of residue, there's very little nitrous oxide emission. But as you exceed two tons of residue, again, you get a very steep increase in nitrous oxide emission. And the leftmost edge of this graph is showing what happens with the addition of legume without any manure. Uh, so even so, without adding any inorganic fertilizer and without adding any manure, you can get quite high emissions of nitrous oxide from a legume cover crop. If we add a lot of cover crop residue and a lot of manure, we get into the red area shown here. Uh, where you get an even greater amount of nitrous oxide emission. So, so what's going on here? Uh, this graph is the same experiment and it's showing the importance of different factors in contributing to nitrous oxide emission. So the top factor is the amount of manure residue. So that's the most important factor in the model. The next most important one is called CO2 flux here. And what this means is emission of carbon dioxide from the field, which is an indication of soil activity uh, and microbial activity in the soil. Uh, this is important, however, because the authors uh, show this and other evidence in the paper that by adding a lot of organic matter at the same time that you're adding nitrogen, you can actually create conditions where you get more nitrous oxide emission. So specifically those conditions are a lack of oxygen in the soil. That's when you get high nitrous oxide emissions. So what this graph is showing is that adding soil carbon uh, increases carbon dioxide emission and also can increase nitrous oxide emission. So here are three take home messages from this experiment. Adding organic matter can increase nitrous oxide emissions. A second, we wanna make sure never to add excess nitrogen as inorganic fertilizer, uh, as we saw previous examples or in manure and legumes. And in terms of managing the cover crops, we might consider a, a mixture of grass and legume cover crops, especially when we're also uh, using manure in the system. So I'm gonna to touch on a few uh, important topics about uh, the, the overall topic of greenhouse gas emissions uh, from cropping systems. And I hope you got to hear Jennifer Whiteman's previous talk where uh, she went into these in greater detail. For carbon sequestration to work, the carbon must not be released back to the atmosphere. So does this happen with tillage and cover crops? I'll let you think about that for a moment. Uh, 
and talk about permanence. Some strategies are permanent, uh, like preventing greenhouse gas emission with reduced tractor passes or with precision nitrogen fertilizer use. Other strategies are not permanent, but they may have other benefits, such as adding organic matter to soil. So the benefit of, of cover crops, or the benefit of just focus on tillage, part of the benefit is permanent in that we've reduced tractor passes. Part of the benefit that's due to soil carbon sequestration is not permanent. So it's in, in moving towards wrapping up here, it's, it's really important to count all three greenhouse gases. Um, because nitrous oxide is so much more potent than carbon dioxide, a little bit of increased nitrous oxide can wipe out any benefit uh, from soil carbon sequestration. If yield decreases, it can result in leakage, which can, can cause high greenhouse gas emissions somewhere else. So I won't... Um, spend much time on this slide. Uh, but again, we need to be thinking about practices that are permanent, uh, real, uh, as well as verifiable. So we don't want uh, leakage where emissions get shifted to another location. So here are the five uh, takeaway messages from, from my talk today. I'm not going to read every every word here, but just again say permanence is is important. Uh, we need to pay attention to and avoiding uh, reduction in yield. Nitrogen dominates emissions from from crops, so we need to pay pay close attention to to better management of nitrogen uh, fertilizer as well as manure and legumes. And again, the, the bottom line is we really need to look at the net greenhouse gas benefit uh, when we're thinking about the benefits of any, any practice. I have some literature cited that you can uh, access later if you're interested. Uh, and again, want to acknowledge support uh, from USDA and others for our previous work. Lastly, uh, we as Jennifer mentioned previously, we have upcoming webinars in this series in the 18th of November and the 16th of December. And you can get further information about that at our website. Thanks very much. So we should have time for some questions now. And I believe we will start, uh, Joe, with questions from the live audience for a few minutes. Um, Peter, we had a question about more periodic use of cover crops um, because a lot of farms, maybe they can get it in after wheat, but maybe it's not possible every year or the weather, weather dependent. So let me make sure I'm understanding. So the question is, if you have a crop rotation, there may be some times in the rotation where cover crops work well and other times in the rotation where they don't. Is, is that the... Is that the issue? Just the year. I mean, a lot of guys couldn't get cover crops in this year anyway, but the way that plants use cover crops on different Yeah, and the weather and how sure. that Sure. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of variables that have to be addressed in implementing practices. I, I guess what I would say is uh, there are many reasons why cover crops might not be implemented every year. But if you implement them in the times that make sense within the weather and the cropping system, uh, even if you implement them only uh, some of the years, you will still get some cumulative benefit from that. Uh, obviously, there's also an interaction with, with tillage, of, you know, how much soil carbon benefit you'll get from that practice. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of complexity in managing cover crops. Uh, as, as many of you know, better, better than I do. But timing of, of, uh, uh, of 
terminating the cover crop before the main crop is planted, you know, attending to that carefully to make sure you're not getting a reduction in yield. There are a lot of details to be attended to. Uh, so I don't know if, I, I hope I'm answering the question at least a little bit. Uh, I, I guess in summary, I would say uh, using cover crops when they are maintaining or improving yield of the main crops uh, is a great strategy, even if it can't be done every year. The other thing I'll, I'll add in is if there's an opportunity to add a, a crop rather than a cover crop that is not used for any, any uh, direct, you know, it's not harvested for any purpose, you know, always looking for the opportunities to have a, a winter crop, whether it could be harvested for forage or, uh, or harvested as a product, you know, that's an important thing to look at as well, since those winter crops can provide some of the benefits of a cover crop, but you're also getting additional production. Any other questions? I have a last question. So we mentioned um, product demand and when you can see um, the variables to account for this um, and greenhouse gases. I was wondering if, as an extension um, authority, if there's going to be, and if, if there's legislation to, uh, that um, requires a verifiable data to be collected, uh, will Um, Peter, if the question was um, kind of what what is verification with the CLCPA? What's that going to look like on the ground? Is it going to be state employees, extension people? Is it going to be private groups? A little bit on that. Uh, sure. Um, I think the short answer is I don't know, and I don't think anyone else knows. Um, I'm. I, I'll say a little bit more and then give the opportunity, uh, Jennifer, if you want to chime in. Uh, so this, the state is focusing now on trying to understand what are the mitigation options in agriculture and every other sector and how might they encourage uh, adoption of those practices. Um, so, I don't know of specific plans that the state has other than the ongoing greenhouse gas inventory. Um, I think at the state level, the inventory will be a tool for trying to account for the changes in greenhouse gases over time. As Jennifer mentioned, that will always be looking backwards a bit. Um, if there are direct payments made to farmers for implementing practices, I think that's where it's likely there may be some requirements for verification. And as I say, I don't think anyone knows what that would look like now. I'll just chime in and say, I agree. The inventory sets the baseline and that's really important for the beginning of measurement. And then after you have the baseline and you have these tools to measure, uh, then you can get to verification, but it, we are far away from that. And I will just say that um, I think that Reggie probably doesn't allow offsets right now because partly because of this problem in order to ensure that real mitigation is achieved. Verification is very complicated in that sense. And, um, and you know, some of the voluntary offset markets uh, require the person who is making the offset to pay the third party verifier. So even though you might be earning $15 a ton from a voluntary third party system right now, you have to hire a third party verifier. So there's all kinds of things that haven't been found, haven't been figured out. Um, and that's why we're trying to advocate for real and permanent mitigation strategies so that the verification is quite simple, requires very little 
effort because they're so clearly doing the job. As we get more sophisticated, of course, we can get we can start addressing things that are more nuanced, like you know all of the the variables that Peter talked about in his talk. I do want to add one more piece here uh, that verification is d depends on the scale that you're talking about. So so far we've been talking only about verification at the field scale. That is very difficult and expensive. However, at the state scale or the national scale, there are less expensive opportunities, I think, for verification. So for example, we can use satellite remote sensing to detect how many farms in New York and in the US are using winter cover cropping. And we can also use satellite remote sensing to get a pretty good idea of some major differences in tillage practices. Uh, and the issues of making a prediction with a model for a specific field, as I mentioned, our fast greenhouse gas model and many other models are intended to give the right answer as an average value across many farms and fields. And they do a much better job of that than they do at making a prediction for a specific field. So this is all to say that the job of estimating the benefit of soil health practices across New York State over time, that's an easier job than quantifying the benefit in a specific field. So that's just an important kind of spatial scale issue. It's still not easy at the state scale, but it is, uh, it is much easier and less costly uh, than doing it for every single field. Peter, last question, since we're thinking about cover crops and no-till and who can get paid for those types of things. What about the maybe the farmers that have been at, at cover cropping and no-tilling for a long time and already have soil organic carbon levels much higher? Or how can, do you ha have any thoughts on how they might have? Yeah. Sure, so I think the question here is kind of if, if the state or anyone else is rewarding farmers for a specific uh, practice uh, to provide benefits to all of society, there's, there's a question about what about the people who are ahead of the curve and already adopted these practices and have been doing them for years or decades? Shouldn't they be getting some benefit? And this is not really a greenhouse gas accounting question. Um, this is really kind of an equity question about how do we support farming? Um, and so I don't feel like I have any uh, particular professional uh, information to offer about you know, what's a fair result there. I think this is a question for all the citizens of New York. If we are gonna pay uh, farmers for a greenhouse gas benefit, how are we going to have a system that does that in a way that is uh, that is real and permanent and also is equitable for the farmers? Thanks, Peter. Great job. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.